and welcome everyone. I am pleased to welcome you as the Organic Center presents today's webinar, Tools Organic Farmers Need to Meet Food Safety Requirements, Learnings from a National Needs Assessment. We're thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Patrick Bauer, Assistant Professor of the, at the University of Rhode Island, along with our Moderator and Director of Science Programs at the Organic Center, Dr. Amber Sligo. A couple of housekeeping items before we start the presentation as folks keep joining us today. This webinar is being recorded. At the end of the session, I will share a file with all of the resources and studies that we've referenced today, and they will include some links if they are available. You'll also be able to access this file in a follow-up email from the webinar team um, that the Organic Center will send. Uh, if you're unable to stay with us throughout the entire presentation, you'll still get that file afterward. Don't worry about it. In the next two business days, in that follow-up email, you're also going to find the slides from the discussion today, a link to view that document, contact information for our speakers, and a link to view the conversation, the presentation today. During registration, we ask that you let our presenters know any questions that you had on today's topic. We thank you so much for those questions, which have been taken into account in today's discussion. And I will note that we will have a brief Q&A session today as well. For any questions or comments that you have throughout the webinar today, please use the Q&A panel on the platform and we'll follow up with you either directly or in the Q&A. If you have any questions that aren't addressed today, please feel free to share your questions and comments with our presenters afterward through that uh, contact information. It will be shared on the screen later in the presentation from Dr. Bauer or um, in the email as well. And finally, what I will say here is if you have any technical questions or concerns as the webinar is going, please feel free to use that questions pane or the chat box and message me directly for some assistance today. The Organic Center is a nonprofit research and education organization based out of Washington, D.C. They work to conduct and convene credible evidence-based science on the environmental and health effects of organic food and farming and to communicate those findings to the public. The Organic Center's work is supported by companies and individuals who desire a sustainable and secure food system that promotes the health of humans and the environment. The Organic Trade Association is a membership-based organization for the organic industry. We ensure that all parts of the organic value chain have a strong voice in government and in our communities. We bring farmers and processors, distributors, retailers, and others together to promote and protect the growing organic sector. OTA represents its members to government on sector needs, market development and promotion, and strong organic standards and regulations. Our members also receive the latest information and quick answers on organic regulations and standards in the United States and around the world. We'll share more information later in that follow-up email if you have any additional questions about membership at the Trade Association. And finally, with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Amber Saligo, Director of Science Programs at the Organic Center, who will be here to start the discussion and then welcome our guest. Thanks so much, Amber. Thanks, Libby. And welcome everyone. It's so great to see so many people who are interested in today's topic. Um, and looking at the list of participants, it seems that we've even had um, some personal conversations with many of you who are joining us today. And I'd like to say I appreciate the expertise that you've shared with us and I thank you for being here um, joining us again. So today I'm going to start with a little bit different than how we usually do it. I'm going to start with a story about my personal journey. Um, to how we launched a national needs assessment to learn more about the challenges that organic farmers are facing when they're trying to comply with organic certification and third-party food safety regulations simultaneously. So I'll give an example of one of these challenges before introducing our other presenter, Dr. Patrick Bauer. He will then walk you through the details of our project, um, its results, and our plans for uh, future research on this topic. Uh, throughout, we'll have some poll questions that will sort of allow you to offer your perspective and opinions. And throughout the whole time, the whole webinar, as Libby mentioned, just please feel free to ask us questions in the Q&A box. And um, Dr. Bauer and I will try to address those questions during the webinar. Um, but if we can't get to them, then we'll um, get to the Q&A session at the end. All right. 
So I'm going to start my story back when I was a postdoctoral researcher in the Kremen lab at University of California, Berkeley, way back in 2011. Uh, at the time, my goal was to measure the impacts of field level diversification on biodiversity and then explore whether the resulting biodiversity um, improved yields for organic farmers. My work was centered in the Central Coast region, spanning the Pajaro and Salinas Valleys. And I just wanted to share a little bit of background context for this system. So this region of California is known as the salad bowl, largely for all the leafy greens that it produces. It also is a region that grows a lot of berries and it is a hot spot for organic production in general. Um, according to the most recent CDFA organic report, which was uh, collected data from 2020, Monterey and Santa Cruz counties that um, make up this region, uh, including Salinas Valley, um, together they equaled nearly 20% of organic sales for California organic farmers and nearly 45% of organic sales for California handlers. And that equaled a combined total of over $3.5 billion, um, which is almost 6% of total U.S. organic sales in 2020, just from these two counties alone. This region was also home to an unfortunately notorious outbreak of E. coli that was linked to spinach back in 2006. And that outbreak received national attention um, and also prompted a new wave of regulatory changes that were aimed at mitigating the risk of repeating that incident. Uh, this changed the culture around food safety in the region. Um, and in some places, fear really took hold and major precautionary actions were taken by a lot of farmers and handlers. And one of the most pivotal, pivotal, pivotal <laughs> moments from my work happened um, with a conversation that I had with Dr. Eric Brennan, who manages the research at the long-term organic USDA ARS plot in Salinas. I met with him to see if this site would be a good candidate for my field studies because there was a mature flowering hedgerow that bordered a couple sides of this farm, which made it attractive for me to study pollinators. But in our introductory conversation, he told me that the fate of this particular hedgerow was up in the air. Apparently, um, his neighbor was really upset about this hedgerow and had been asking Eric to take it out for years. Uh, his neighbor said that the birds that were coming from the hedgerow were um, eating his broccoli and it was a huge problem for him. And so as Eric's telling me the story, I'm looking at the hedgerow and I'm looking at this neighboring farm, which was enormous. And I realized that the size of the hedgerow is very tiny in comparison to the neighboring field. And I just couldn't imagine that the birds would eat enough broccoli to warrant the removal of this habitat restoration effort. But um, I quickly learned that the problem was not the yield loss that was related to the eaten product, but instead the perceived food safety risk that was created when the birds entered the field. And the previous year that broccoli farmer um, had nearly lost his wholesale contract from his buyer because of that perceived food safety risk. So this story kind of blew my mind, um, partly because I just hadn't considered the potential harm that quote unquote beneficial biodiversity could cause. And then this was like an added levels, another socioeconomic dimension, um, which I had not considered before. It was definitely outside my area of expertise, but it did make me really excited to learn more and try to incorporate this aspect into uh, my future research in the area. And as the research team at the Crimin Lab grew, um, our goals also grew to measure not just the benefits of biodiversity, but also um, potential trade-offs. And I like to walk through one example of these trade-offs, sort of sticking with that subject of the hedgerow story. Um, the success of biodiversity conservation can be measured by population growth of larger animals that are sort of closer to the top of the food chain. And in agricultural fields, <clears throat> this often means birds. And we get really excited when we see birds of prey out in these fields because we know that they can help control pest animals. So this diagram um, from members of our Central Coast Research Team shows how birds of prey can eat pest animals, but also ones that are considered beneficial as well. 
in this case, we're still talking about birds, where um, pest birds are those that eat crops and beneficial birds are those that eat insects that eat crops. So they're um, offering natural pest control. And then when we add this added dimension of food safety, both birds can be considered pests when they poop in the fields, increasing the risk of spreading foodborne pathogens. And since natural habitat supports all kinds of wildlife and wildlife was linked um, to that 2006 E. coli outbreak that I mentioned earlier, some of the precautionary measures that farmers took uh, was to remove large swaths of natural habitat that bordered farms. So these pictures here show um, some habitat removal after that 2006 outbreak. It's a little bit tricky to see in this slide because I couldn't make it really big for you, but the biggest difference that you'll notice is um, in that long strip on the right side of both of the images uh, that's bordering the farm. Uh, on the, the 2005 image, you can see that there's green within that orange border on the image on the left. And then um, on the one on the right, there's white in, in, the, um, in that border indicating vegetation removal. And then beside that, we have a graph that indicates the uh, percent reduction in the different uh, types of habitat. So we see a 13.5% loss of marshlands, 17.5% loss in open habitat, 11.2% loss in early succession habitat, and 8.5% loss in late succession or um, old growth habitat. And I do want to mention that uh, while this response was pretty brash, it also was not really based off of solid scientific evidence uh, that shows that removing habitat would indeed reduce food safety risk. And since this time, a lot of research has been conducted, um, and some of it shows that natural habitat does not always increase food safety risks and, in fact, can instead reduce them. Uh, Libby mentioned at the beginning that I have created a handout that provides you all with um, several research papers that are relevant to this topic that has come out of this region. Um, Again, with uh, many of the authors were, are, were uh, past Kerman Lab members um, working in this region, including Dr. Bauer, uh, with whom I collaborated during our overlapping time at UC Berkeley. So I think she, I can't remember what she said, she's going to share it in the chat or if it's going to come out to you later, but definitely take a look if you're interested. Okay, so. Um, I'm noting that this habitat loss is devastating in itself from a conservation point of view, uh, but some of you might be wondering what this has to do with organic. Um, and I will say that according to the National Org Organic Program guidance on natural resources and biodiversity, in order for organic farmers to be compliant for certification, biodiversity has to be maintained and promoted and practices that can diminish biodiversity must be avoided. So this means that Habitat removal is in direct conflict with organic standards. But what if you know, you're a farmer and your buyer says that food safety is more important and implies that you should remove all risks of wildlife intrusion? Or what if your third party food safety um, auditor suggests something similar? It, these sorts of things can put organic farmers in a bind. And this is just one example of a tension between organic standards and food safety mitigation requirements. Um, we have identified others, such as uh, perceived and real food safety risks that are related to the use of manure-based organic soil amendments, um, chlorine-based water treatments and sanitizers that are not allowed according to the National List of Allowable Substances for Organic Compliance, and then there's also just the administrative burden of compliance for multiple certifications. Uh, so I'd like to fast forward about eight years from that initial conversation at the USDA organic plot back in Salinas to my time at the Organic Center. One of our missions is to fill knowledge gaps in organic research. And we are constantly engaging with organic stakeholders to try to identify what those research needs are. And in those efforts, I was still hearing about challenges for organic farmers to meet food safety requirements. And I realized that um, you know, there was more that needed to be done to help solve this problem. And the first step was to try to more formally identify what the biggest challenges were for organic farmers at a national level. So I called up Dr. Bauer here 
and I asked him if he'd be willing to lead a planning grant proposal uh, to submit to the USDA OREI program and try to get some funding to do a national needs assessment and then ultimately develop a full research proposal around this topic. And I'm delighted to say that he agreed, much as you suspected, and also that we won the funding. So I am really happy to be collaborating with him again um, on this work so many years later, and I'm also excited to introduce him to you all. Uh, lately on our webinars, we haven't really been uh, presenting bios of presenters, but today I think it's relevant uh, because beyond presenting the results of our survey, Dr. Barr will be leading the full ORI research proposal to follow. And so for anyone who's in the audience today here who's interested in collaborating with that effort, I thought you might want to get to know a little bit of background about you know, the, the future project leader. So here I go into Dr. Bauer's bio. He received uh, his bachelor's in environmental science and public policy in Harvard, um, Harvard University. He got his PhD in environmental science policy and management at the University of California, Berkeley. And that's where we work together through the Center for Diversified Farming Systems and the Berkeley Food Institute. And he is currently assistant professor in the College of Environment and Life Sciences at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, Dr. Bauer is considered an interdisciplinary scholar of sustainable food system policy uh, and socio-technical innovation. His research and teaching examines social structural barriers to and incentives for sustainable and just transitions in food systems. He examines the ways in which agricultural and food policies, um, markets, technologies, laws, and other institutions intersect with the practical management of food, food production systems uh, to produce outcomes that will impact both people and the environment. So through his work, he aims to promote better balance among livelihoods, ecosystems, and human health. It's like true sustainability right there. So today, um, he's going to walk us through the planning grant process and the results of our national means assessment before we solicit future participation in the full proposal pro uh, process at the end of this webinar. And so with that, I'd like to go ahead and ask Patrick to take over the mic. Great, thank you, Amber, so much. Um, uh, good, I've got slide control. Well, again, uh, thank you so much to Amber and to Libby before you um, for that excellent introduction to uh, to this project. I think it really sets the stage quite nicely. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be discussing um, the results of what we termed this National Organic Food Safety Survey that was funded by a planning grant from USDA's Organic Research and Extension Initiative. You can uh, see the award number there um, at the bottom of this slide. So I want to acknowledge our funders. Um, as uh, Amber mentioned, we will be pursuing a full grant proposal. Uh, those are four-year, fairly large grants to look more closely at this topic um, and hopefully actually start developing some tools. And I'll get into that in a moment, and we'll come back to it again at the end. Um, so uh, I want to give just a little bit of background on what this project, sort of building from Amber's overview, sort of what we decided to do about that. So again, as Dr. Skilligo was, was explaining, um, there's this kind of issue, right, where organic farmers in particular, because of the unique um, constraints uh, necessary to be an organic grower in this country uh, under, under the NOP, um, that can introduce unique costs and challenges in trying to meet both NOP standards and various food safety requirements. Um, and we really looked around, and there was no research at the time that we put this together that really sought to, A, synthesize, collect and synthesize, the current experiences and the really specific pre-harvest food safety needs and challenges of the organic growing community. Um, and so as a result of that, we sort of um, believe that very few food safety tools have been designed that are specifically for organic production. Um, and these are tools not just for growers, but also for extension agents, various other farm advisors, and also for the auditing and certification 
uh, communities as well. Um, and so our long-term goal really was to try to develop research programs that reduce the burden of compliance with multiple regulations, with um, trying to meet organic standards, trying to also be up to date and compliant with various food safety best practices and, and standards, um, largely by equipping uh, farmers and industry stakeholders with um, feasible, uh, in particular cost effective, uh, and organic compliant tools that they can use to, again, keep up on the food safety side of things, particularly, again, in the pre-harvest environment. And before continuing, I do want to make a small distinction here in terms of these multiple regulations. Um, because on the organic side, it's fairly straightforward. There's sort of one national organic program set of standards, and that is organic. You're either there or you're not. On the food safety side of things, it's a little bit more complicated. So many of you are probably familiar with the uh, produce safety rule under the Food Safety Modernization Act. That's FDA's um, rule, which has been around now since um, uh, 2015, that sort of is governing uh, what farmers are doing for food safety in the pre-harvest environment, so in the fields. Um, that's at a federal regulatory level. That, that's, that's mandated by government. But there are a variety of other food safety requirements that can come into effect as well that sort of layer on uh, to that sort of initial just baseline FSMA. Uh, and those can be voluntary um, food safety certifications. So um, GAPS is really common, harmonized GAPS, USDA GAPS. Um, and increasingly today, it's the GFSI, or Global Food Safety Initiative, benchmarked uh, standards of different sorts um, that farmers, you know, pay a certain amount, private auditor comes out and, and assesses whether or not they meet the certification standards and then you get that certification standard. So that's sort of like level two. And then in certain situations, um, growers may also have to comply with additional um, food safety related requirements that are requested by the companies to which they are selling. We see this mostly in the larger wholesale markets or particularly selling into food service and some of the larger uh, food retail chains. So there's this whole sort of landscape of different kinds of food safety requirements. And that'll become relevant in a moment when I talk about exactly how we set up this project to try to deal with having one NOP standard on one side and sort of multiple levels on the food safety side. Um, so again, we are funded by um, uh, OREI, it was a one-year grant, it's just $50,000, but primarily what that was supporting was this national needs assessment, which was a big online survey, um, all in, in a bunch of listening sessions that we conducted as well, all in service to the idea that we want to produce a full research project uh, to submit to OREI for funding um, that really will address the priority needs, the, most, the lowest hanging fruit for the highest priorities uh, for the organic growing uh, community to again try to resolve any of these incongruities that, that we can. Um, and so we had a core research team and we also have a multi-stakeholder advisory committee. Um, this is our, our core research team, some of whom I know are, are on the call today. Um, so these folks were all uh, directly uh, participating in, in the conduct of, uh, in the implementation of this project as well. So I want to recognize their contributions. Um, so we wanted to uh, really do three things with this planning grant, and today I'm mostly going to be presenting here on uh, the first two in that blue box there. So we wanted to gather current information on organic growers' experiences with any kind of incongruities or tensions or just challenges between meeting food safety requirements and maintaining organic certification. Um, and then secondarily, to assess any priorities that they might have for the kind of research that might help reduce any incongruities that they had experienced or were worried about experiencing. Um, and again, this is all sort of in service, and this webinar is really the first uh, piece that's sort of bridging from part two to point three there. Um, again, all in service to developing a research project to really address those identified needs and priorities. Um, so what we did is we, we conducted this national needs assessment. 
which is a big online survey uh, that uh, Washington State University's uh, Survey Center, which has a lot of experience working with the growing community, um, uh, we contracted them to run the survey. We developed the questionnaire and, and the distribution and so forth, and then asked them to run it. Uh, and we distributed, in it, distributed that survey in two different ways. So first of all, we had this long list of about 3,600 organic farm operators identified through the um, organic uh, integrity database that USDA maintains. Um, so we emailed all those folks a whole bunch to try to get them to respond. Uh, and then we also distributed an open link through various uh, organic industry listservs and uh, social media channels, OTA, and uh, the Organic Center helped out a lot with that. Um, and that survey ran from February through June of this year. And here's where I want to come back to that point about, you know, you've got one NLP standard on one side and a variety of different sort of food safety requirements on the other. And to sort of simplify that as much as possible, we really wanted to focus on um, a, a particular subset of organic growers. Um, so A, you know, anybody responding to the poll, we did want them to be an organic grower. So that meant they had to grow organic certified crops for human consumption or be actively in the process of transitioning some of their acreage and production into organic. So kind of be in that three year transition window. So that was the first eligibility requirement. And then the second eligibility requirement, which was much more restrictive, was that the respondent had to have currently, had had in the past, or be actively considering or exploring getting third-party food safety certification that included a pre-harvest component. So that meant that we really wanted folks that had that mid-tier level of food safety requirements. So these are those uh, voluntary food safety certification standards that I mentioned earlier. So this is general, and the reason we did that is because generally speaking, when we're looking at things particularly around um, relation to non-crop vegetation, relation to um, wildlife habitat, the kind of biodiversity related conservation concerns that Amber mentioned earlier on, at the FISMA level, a lot of the requirements are extraordinarily open-ended in terms of what farmers are actually expected to do. And it's only really at um, sort of higher levels that we begin to see more specific um, requirements that, that have an effect on, on that sort of um, non-crop vegetation, that sort of potential wildlife habitat. Um, again, oriented around controlling the intrusion of wild animals, which are considered to be potential reservoirs for foodborne pathogens, controlling the intrusion of those animals into fields. Um, so we really wanted to focus uh, on respondents that had some experience with that level of, um, of food safety requirements. Uh, so that was sort of why we set those eligibility requirements. And what it meant is that we really um, were focused on organic growers that had, again, food safety certification experience. And before we get into the results, just go over what that survey covered. So we asked some, a whole bunch of questions, just sort of collected some basic characteristics so we know what kind of farms were responding. So um, in particular, annual sales, because we know from uh, certain exclusions and um, partial exemptions that are built into FISMA that farm size is a big determinant of what's going on in terms of food safety. Uh, and so uh, is the proportion of direct to consumer sales. So the, the actual market channel into which produce is going um, past research and the structure of FISMA itself um, strongly suggests that the, uh, the market channel, uh, which again we proxied by the percentage of uh, direct consumer sales, that that has a major effect in terms of what kinds of food safety requirements farmers uh, and organic growers are expected to comply with. We also, of course, collected some information about uh, the location by state, um, the kind of crops that uh, the farm is growing, the presence of livestock or draft animals on the farm and then uh, years of farming experience. <clears throat> so we have some information about generally kind of who responded to the surveys. And then we asked about their experiences. So what they directly experienced in terms of meeting both organic certification standards and requirements for third party pre-harvest food safety certification or audits. And again, we set up eligibility requirements that meant that we really were hearing from folks that had direct experience with both sides of this issue. Um, the organic side and, and the food safety side. 
And then we also asked folks for their opinions uh, on the priority of different types of tension between organic food safety requirements and uh, different research avenues for addressing those tensions. And I want to point out that as we move along here, there's going to be a couple poll opportunities for all of you um, as uh, participants on this call. Um, and basically, we're going to pitch some of these same kind of questions, slightly modified, back to you to just sort of see what you think um, we, we might have found, what your expectations are, and then whether or not you were sort of, you know, kind of get, gauge your reaction to some of our findings. So just heads up, a couple polls are going to be coming your way. So it is a little bit interactive today. Okay, so what we found. Um, we had in bold there um, about 180 or so usable responses. Now, again, you'll note that this is out of thousands of people that we reached out to. So the raw response rate is, in terms of the way surveys go, very low. And that's an important caveat as we get into some of the results that I'm going to present. Um, for our first phase of distribution, we had a response rate, including the folks that responded to the survey but were ineligible or didn't finish it or refused to take it or something like that. We had a response rate of between 5 and 6% which again means that 95% of people we didn't hear from. Uh, we were able to collect some additional responses through that open distribution link, but again, we really only have 100 respondents across the entire country that have both organic and food safety experience that responded to our poll. So I want to just put out there to, to take some of the results that, we're about, that I'm about to present here with a hefty grain of salt. These, these are not going to be representative, representative in any sort of strict quantitative sense, they're at the most suggestive and can sort of suggest some, op some things that we might want to look at. Um, but again, we had a lot of folks that did take the time to fill out our survey and provide us this information, and so we're going to be presenting what we found. Um, and I just want to note that um, just an overall issue with doing this kind of work is that it's getting harder and harder every year to conduct academic surveys with farmers and growers. Um, the response rate, I've been doing this for a number of years. Um, one of my colleagues, Aaron Adalja, has done this a number of times as well. And it seems that every time we try to run one of these surveys, um, the response rate keeps getting lower and lower. Um, so that's going to be a major issue moving forward for this and future research. Uh, in order to align what's going on with research with the actual needs of the growing community, there's an increasing difficulty of being able to do that through this survey method. So I just want to throw that out there um, as sort of a tangential finding here. All right, so I want to just go over some of the folks that we heard from and just kind of um, give you a sense of, of who our respondents were. So we had broad responses from really all over the country, as you can see here. And this is uh, our 103 respondents who had both uh, organic and food safety um, experience. Um, really high representation from the Northeast, particularly in New York, you see highlighted there. Colorado, as might be expected, um, and then uh, Oregon and California. So some of like the larger organic producing states, not that, um, not that surprising um, in particular. Um, and we also checked, we, we asked as many of the growers as we could who were ineligible to take most of the survey because they didn't have food safety certification experience. We did ask some of them um, some, some questions, so we have a little bit of information about those so we can compare because we were curious what kinds of barriers there might be for growers um, preventing them from, from getting some sort of food safety certification or seeking food safety certification. Um, so here are um, the results here. So you can see, you know, the Midwest highlights a little bit. And it's a little bit easier to see in this map. And keep in mind that these numbers are extremely low, so don't read too much into this. But again, we see this sort of... Um, uh, Florida, the southeast, the middle of the country, and so forth, kind of standing out in terms of having super caveat around this. Um, uh, um, less uh, sort of food safety certification uh, formality uh, compared to the coasts. So that's kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> so again, I mentioned earlier that Farm size, which we measure by annual sales, that's the way that um, basically it breaks down in terms of FISM exemptions, which you can see here in orange. 
Um, and we had a really good spread. So we had um, a really large number of respondents in that middle category. So between 25,000 and 500,000 in annual sales, um, which are partially exempt from FISMA requirements. Um, but we still had a really good uh, cohort from $500,000 and up, so our much larger farms, um, and a nice solid cohort of folks that are exempt uh, from, uh, from FISMA rules as well because they're under $25,000 in annual sales. Um, and I've overlaid the folks that don't have food safety certification uh, experience here as well. That's the lighter blue. And as you might expect, that aligns pretty closely with uh, annual sales. It's much less likely that a, a smaller scale farm will, will go through the extra um, uh, cost and work of getting a food safety certification than larger scale farms. So it's kind of why you see that decline there. Interestingly, uh, that pattern didn't hold for <laughs> um, proportion of direct to consumer sales. We did have a really nice spread in terms of um, we had a solid cohort of respondents that were not selling at all direct to consumers, and then a whole range of, of farms. So farms that were selling a quarter or, or half or three quarters of their produce direct to consumer, all the way up to farms that were selling the vast majority, up to 100%. Um, and you can see that the pattern there, that kind of U shape, holds across both um, those with food safety certification and those without, um, which, which is sort of interesting and something we'll be digging into a little bit more to see if we can suss out any further insights from that pattern. But that's what we have so far. Um, in terms of the crops grown, uh, as folks who are familiar with organic and particularly food safety might expect, we had a lot of respondents who grow vegetables, melons, and potatoes, um, small berries, herbs, and tree fruit. So, of course, uh, the crops for human consumption that are most associated with food safety risk, largely because they're eaten uh, raw or processed in a way that doesn't necessarily have a kill step, right, that would eliminate um, most of the, the kind of food safety risk. So really uh, good to see that we had high response rates in those categories. Um, oh, and I just uh, go back to the slide for a second. Um, to note that uh, we did have a fair number of, of farms that grew a bunch of other things as well. So we had a fair number of farms that had a sort of diversified um, kind of crop portfolio in a way, including forage and so forth. And that's because a lot of our farms, as we'll see in a moment, uh, also had livestock and draft animals uh, on the farm, which is a really important food safety element. The um, cows, uh, pigs, chickens, uh, various draft animals and so forth, are and can be, um, you know, reservoirs for a lot of the uh, um, enteric foodborne uh, human pathogens, E. coli, for example, or salmonella. Um, so that can be a particular food safety challenge, having to manage having animals like that on the farm and also growing uh, some of these vegetable and fruit crops. Um, so again, you can see here that um, a, so a little bit under a third of our, uh, our respondents had uh, such animals on the farm. So that integration of, of crops and livestock, uh, definitely something that uh, the farms and, and our response pool here are, are managing. Um, and again, we had a very experienced um, respondent pool overall. Um, the vast majority had more than 10 years of farming experience. Um, interestingly, again, these are small numbers, so I wouldn't put too much, don't want to, you know, capitalize this or anything like that. But we did have a slightly higher proportion of people with, without um, food safety certification who had less farming experience, which again, probably associated with smaller farm size, less social and financial capital, which um, tends to be associated with, again, less formality in food safety. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but again, we, we overall had a very experienced respondent pool. Okay. So that's what our farmer demographics look like um, overall, just sort of kind of a general profile of the farms that responded to the survey. We're going to next go into some of what we heard from them in terms of their experiences managing for both organic and, um, and food safety uh, standards. And before we get into it, I want to just kind of put out this poll for all of you. Um, so take a few minutes, just fill that out. Whatever you expect, it's not too scientific. We'll give, a, we'll give it a minute. Um.
All right, so it looks like uh, most folks have had a chance to respond. Thanks for, for participating. Um, uh, Libby, can we go ahead and maybe show what we've got there? Maybe I can do it. Yeah, here we go. So here, here's, here's the responses. So um, about a quarter of you picking operational or production challenges, so that would be sort of farm management related challenges, actually what's going on in the field. Um, again, yes, yeah, 70% of you put picking out administrative cost and record keeping challenges. Um, and so forth. So let, let's let's see um, let's see what our respondents actually had to say. Um, so close that poll out there. Okay. So challenges experienced. So we'll, we'll look at operational and production challenges first. Um, and here you can see uh, I've broken it down here by FISMA category. So on the left are the very small under twenty five thousand dollar annual revenue farms exempt. In the middle, we have the partial exempt, and on the far side, we have the fully covered more than $500,000 in annual sales. Orange uh, here is folks that said, yes, we do have operational um, or production challenges. And this is out of only 68 respondents, by the way, because it was um, only people that uh, um, have or had actually had a food safety certification. So we didn't include here people that were, that were pursuing uh, third-party food safety certification. Um, and as you can see, uh, a grand total of 37%, so a little over a third of the respondents, said that they actually had experienced um, operational and production-related challenges. Um, interestingly, the highest percentage of our exempt farms, though it was such a small number that I wouldn't put too much stock in that particular data point, but what was interesting is that um, the fully covered farms, a slightly higher proportion than the partially exempt farms, reported experiencing these production challenges. So kind of interesting that we see um, that really coming out in the larger farm size. Um, so that was on the production end. Uh, and we saw about the same pattern on the administrative challenges end. Um, you'll note that it's slightly higher, um, but still, uh, only a total of 41% uh, experience. So pretty similar. If I flip back to the um, uh, production challenges slide, if I can here. Yes, here's production challenges. You'll note just about the same. Um, so that was sort of an interesting. And if we put them together, uh, total number of respondents that experienced either type or both of challenge, either operational production or administrative, we see actually a majority of respondents had um, experienced a challenge, 53%. And a full two-thirds of our fully covered uh, respondents, those are, again, the largest uh, size categories of farms, $500,000 or more in annual sales, a full two-thirds of them reported having experienced challenges in that regard, with 45% of the partially exempt farms. So fairly, you know, fairly significant proportions. Um, all right, so we're going to just have another, uh, another poll here, kind of just following up, um, and just to see what you think about that. So we'll, let's give a second, we'll put that poll up. I'll let you respond to it. Great. Thanks again for participating in our little straw poll here. I think just about everybody's had a chance to weigh in. Um, yeah, and so again, uh, a lot of folks, um, a, lot, a lot of folks think this is about right. A lot of folks thinking, um, you know, more growers might report challenges. And a few folks thought fewer growers would report challenges. Um, and it was a bit of a trick question because I think from our perspective, my perspective certainly, having studied this for a long time, I was a little bit surprised at the proportion of growers reporting uh, production and operational challenges. I did think that would be a little bit lower. Um, and I thought that the administrative sort of cost challenges might be a little bit higher. So sort of uh, interesting, interesting in, in both ways there. So anyhow, so that's, that's sort of where we are there. Um, so we'll, we'll close that poll and, and move on. 
So again, a significant but by no means overwhelming majority of growers experiencing some type of operational or administrative challenge. Um, and then we asked, well, might, is, is there any kind of research that would be needed that might help deal with those challenges? Um, and here again, you see the responses um, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see this. This is a question that went to all of our respondents, so the full pool here is 99. Um, and just about two out of five respondents saying that, yeah, more, more research uh, would be helpful. Um, and uh, not a huge amount of difference between the different uh, farm size classes, uh, but a little bit higher um, request for research from our largest scale farms, who again also sort of reported the highest level of, of challenges, so that's not necessarily too, too surprising. Um, but again, overall, we had about 38% of respondents uh, say that more research would be needed, uh, with only about 22% saying that they didn't believe more research was needed. Um, and we did check to see if there was any sort of breakdown by crops grown, to see if there was like a specific crop type that was experiencing more challenges than others that might need research. Um, and the results, uh, Focus here on the yellow boxes. The, the other three bars have really low numbers that responded to this question, so um, not necessarily uh, super reliable there. But you'll see that among herbs, row vegetables, small berries, and tree fruit, roughly the same uh, number sort of requesting uh, um, more research. So not a whole lot of difference there. Okay. We did go on then to ask about research priorities, and I was kind of curious to see, um, to poll this group here, listening to the call today, what your research priorities might be based on your previous knowledge and experience, um, based on anything you've heard today. Just go ahead and uh, we'll put this poll up and just pick out what you think are the top two. And do note that there's two questions to this poll, so if, if oh wait, no, this is only one question. No, this is two, yeah. So make sure to answer both questions if you get a chance. Okay, it looks like just about everybody has had a chance to respond. Give it just one more second here. Yeah, good. Okay, let's, let's end that there and we'll share the results. Um, there we go, yeah. So, ha, good, we're gonna, we're gonna send that to USDA. 98% of our webinar participants who wanted to hear more about research are interested in more research. Great. Um, no, so, um, but yeah, so we see, um, uh, effective vegetative practices coming out, um, effective livestock, um, uh, some folks pulling out water testing, uh, and so forth. So let's, let's see what our grower respondents had to say about it. And what we can share all the results of these polls uh, after the meeting too, I believe. So if you didn't get a chance to, to really look at those polls and you're curious, you should be able to have access to those later. So this is what we found. Uh, from the growers that responded, uh, roughly ordered by level of importance, as you can see here. Number one, not too surprising, uh, from my perspective at least, compliance costs. Um, a majority of respondents, uh, that's, you can see, I, I put a red line in there at 50%, another red line at 75%. A majority of respondents um, marked compliance costs as a, as a majorly important uh, research uh, traject, um, uh, priority, particularly, you know, the need to figure out what, what the costs are and then I assume lower them. 
Um, and you'll see that more than 90% of respondents put that as either major or moderate uh, importance. So costs really coming through as a big deal. Uh, next, we had the sort of set of four uh, that were water testing, uh, the administrative requirements closely related to costs, that's time, largely speaking, labor time, management time, and so forth. Um, we see effective proximity to livestock, um, pretty high up there, and then compost and organic soil amendments. Um, so water testing, proximity to livestock, and compost being the sort of top three operational or production level challenges that growers wanted more research on uh, after the two administrative challenges of time and cost. Um, after that, uh, we see um, water treatments coming in sort of in the middle of a pack there, crop testing lo much lower down, soil testing much lower down. And then uh, really interestingly, the lowest priority was for the effect of biodiversity enhancing vegetative practices on food safety risk. Um, just 60% of respondents rating that is of major or moderate importance with less than a quarter uh, uh, putting it up there with, with major importance. So in some ways that's maybe good to hear, um, but we don't have a whole lot of context for that, so it's hard to read too much into that. But anyway, that's, that's what we heard from our growers. Um, so again, research priorities. We did also collect some, um, some open-ended responses about the experiences that growers had and the, and the ways that they thought uh, research kind of might help them with that. And, and I sort of lumped these two sets of questions together because our respondents didn't really differentiate between their experiences and the kind of needs that they had. So I put them together. Um, and again, these are, these are open-ended qualitative responses. They largely represent a small pool of our already fairly small pool of respondents. So take it with a bit of a grain of salt, but it provides a little bit of depth and three-dimensionality, I think, to some of what growers are reporting. So there are a couple of themes emerge. So again, cost, administrative time, and so forth really came through as a major issue. Um, and a lot of respondents pulled out redundancy in particular, the idea that they had to go through very similar hoops multiple times. Um, especially noting the overlap in some of the certification requirements between organic and various food safety uh, certification standards. So a bunch of quotes to that effect um, that, we, that we collected there. Um, labor time, again, came out over and over and over again. And, and I've bolded a little bit here from one grower who said, in order to accomplish the hands-on work involved, we're put in a position of filling out paperwork at night or on weekends, which results in extreme stress on all workers. Um, so really just sort of, I think, hammering home that this is this additional uh, labor time burden in addition to just direct costs. It's, it's also just very stressful. Um, another administrative challenge that came out was just challenges interfacing with inspectors and auditors. And a lot of growers sort of question their training and experience, um, either with food safety or with organic standards, depending on which side the certification was coming from. Um, so it seems like there might be, uh, you know, sort of an emerging theme there that's worthy of more, uh, more research. Um, folks talked about water the most in the open-ended questions. So um, some of it just around the excessiveness of, of water testing. As many of you know, um, a revised water rule was released recently that is pretty um, in-depth. <laughs> in terms of what it requires uh, from growers, in terms of testing their water. Um, and uh, that has a lot of growers concern. It's, it's a big administrative and cost burden, as, as these folks indicate. Um, and there's some skepticism about, I think, um, how, how useful that is. That was sort of an interesting finding there. Um, a, a handful of folks called out some other things, soils, uh, sanitizing equipment and tools integrating livestock um, a little bit, not too much, came out there. Then there were some other sort of things that came out of the open-ended responses that we didn't capture in the multiple choice. 
Um, so an interesting theme that emerged over and over was this idea of fairness and the idea that the food safety rules weren't fair. So sometimes that meant that respondents, like the first one here, felt that they were following the rules but others weren't, and that wasn't fair. Um, uh, there were, of course, those that felt that there was a big difference in terms of fairness across farm size. It was hard on the little guy. Um, some felt that it was all in the grower, like the third one here. All, it's all in the grower to sort out any tension between the two, uh, which, is, which is sort of interesting. Um, uh, and the sort of fourth grower there kind of um, getting a little bit um, testy about that as well. There were also some, some growers, uh, and this is, backs up previous or, uh, research that's been done, um, that just expressed various philosophical disagreements, um, mostly with, um, with the way that food safety is being rolled out on the farm. Um, there's a, you know, the, the resistance of many growers to food safety formalization. I wouldn't say food safety per se, but food safety formalization and, and regulation is, I think, well documented. But we see that cropping up again here. Um, you see a grower claiming that it's major retailers' lawyers that are driving food safety, um, or that a lot of food safety requirements have little to do with actual food safety, more about marketing and collecting fees and so forth. So definitely a current of, of distrust there as well, which is sort of interesting. Um, if I can get my slide to progress here. There we go. Yet many, many respondents also reported that they had not experienced a challenge, backing up what we saw from the multiple choice sort of questions. So um, growers reporting no, no challenge, you know, gap plus organic is easy peasy. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, they're just two different things. They don't conflict. It's not rocket science. Um, and some growers even reported synergies. Um, you know, organic farming makes it easier to abide by food safety regula regulations. Or, you know, most of our um, organic growing practices are, are meshing with gaps. Um, and these requirements enhance our focus and understanding of each. So definitely a lot of heterogeneity um, there as well. Um, and I just want to wrap up with a couple insights from, we asked uh, a question of the growers that were organic certified or had organic certification in progress, but they didn't, didn't have any food safety certification experience. We kind of asked them why. Um, and I want to point out that only a very, very few basically indicated lack of awareness or lack of information. That wasn't really so much of an issue. There were a handful that just didn't know about it or didn't know it's a requirement. But the vast majority of responses that we got here indicated that, that they felt that food safety was too expensive, too time consuming, and not worth it. Um, so again, just struggling to survive economically, struggling to get all the work done and not really seeing a, a benefit that would, that would make up for those costs. Um, and a significant proportion also felt that they were already safe enough and they didn't need more. They didn't need to do more. So growers responding perfectly capable of handling our own food safety needs. We're so clean. We're small, therefore we run a tight food safety sh uh, ship and so on. So uh, an, an interest, another sentiment uh, again there that was sort of uh, came through. So again, just want to do one final poll here at the end to kind of get your overall reaction. So um, just in terms of what's needed. Some of these are research items. Um, some of them are maybe not research items, but kind of curious to hear your reactions here at the end before we move into the question and answer portion of, uh, of the talk. So we'll let, leave this open for a few minutes.
Great. Okay, I think we're everybody who's uh, most people have responded now. A couple more filtering in here at the end. <laughs> All right, um, and we'll just sort of share the results here. And uh, again, this is useful. Um, so yeah, really see cost reduction and cost sharing programs coming out on top, not necessarily a research, um, potentially a research uh, avenue or, or an avenue that research could support. Better risk assessment tools coming out, um, uh, yeah, more efficient record keeping, better training of inspectors and auditors and so forth. So we're going we're gonna to sort of um, end this here, but I want to point out that this kind of con a wider conversation about this last point here, this, these poll questions, is what we're going to be launching into as kind of the next, the next phase here. So again, as, as Amber mentioned earlier on, um, uh, if this is a, a project that you are interested in participating in and contributing to um, at sort of whatever level of participation you feel able to, to do that in, please do reach out to us. We can add you to the list for the future planning meetings uh, and, and so forth. Um, so we'd love to hear from you if you have, again, thoughts on how to uh, respond to this, this needs assessment, uh, particularly through any kind of research that we might be able to do, or also extension and, and outreach as well. So yeah, at that point, I think uh, we can move on to, uh, to the, the Q&A. Um, and just see uh, if folks have, have particular questions for us that we might be able to, to help with. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Patrick. I really appreciate uh, such a lovely presentation. And thanks to everyone for um, responding and engaging in those polls. Uh, I will, again, reiterate what Patrick just said. If you have questions, please feel free to submit those right now in the Q&A. And we'll be able to have a great conversation for the, the next few minutes. Um, my first question for both of you is if you could talk a little bit more about what the next steps look like for all this work. Yeah, Amber, do you want to start or? Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll start to look forward. I'll look backwards a little bit and just say that, um, so these planning grants are kind of an amazing opportunity. Um, this is the kind of work that professors and faculty are expected to do uh, sort of in kind, <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, get the data that's needed to um, create a competitive full research grant proposal. And so uh, the center has been really fortunate in receiving several of these planning grant, planning, well, funding for, for these planning. I don't even know how you say that, the proposal, <laughs> planning of proposals. Um, and I'm also excited to say that 100% of full proposals that have been born out of our planning grants have been funded. Um, so this is a very helpful process. At this point in the process, what we have historically done is held like in-person summits, planning summits. It can be amazing to bring people together in the same room and brainstorm, um, you know, with your little whiteboard or sticky pad, whatever. Um, but COVID has made that harder to do in the past. And so we've actually sort of pivoted in our methods. And we're now, instead of having one big planning summit where we bring together like 30 people, we are able to have even more inclusive planning meetings um, by doing it virtually. And I'll also say that this webinar presentation of these survey results, this is the first time that we have held our first you know, planning summit meeting in this format before. So we apologize for this kind of less interactive discussion, top-down sort of thing, but we also recognized um, just from the level of engagement that we've had that these results would probably be pretty interesting for a lot of folks. So we wanted to be able to share that out. Um, so having said that, we will still have another couple planning meetings um, that will be less formal in the future. Um, Patrick and I were talking about hosting something starting maybe mid-October and then again, um, you know, two or three weeks later. And um, the point of those meetings will be to really start diving into um, the, basically like narrowing down the research questions so that a proposal can be written. Yeah, and I can pick up there, um, I think. So when it comes, so what that means if um, you're not quite sure how that's going to come together, is that for, um, 
a full proposal. They're four years. They're up to, I think, $3 million of funding. That doesn't actually, you don't actually get all that because there's overhead. But it's a fair chunk of, of money to support some research activities over the course of four years. Um, and, but even so, the number of objectives, right, sort of the number of things that that project can do will be limited to just a couple. Um, so probably two, three, four objectives. We're not going to be able to, you know, cover that long list of things that was mentioned like in that poll at the end. But, you know, we could, for example, envision doing something like um, developing and piloting and evaluating um, a training module, right, for um, food safety certifiers and inspectors on organic production. So we could do something like that, sort of on like the administrative cost side of things. Um, or we could do something, um, and, and at the same time, we could also do something that was maybe around, say, for example, a risk analysis tool, right? Um, and those two things might even be able to talk to one another, saying like, here's a risk analysis tool. This is what that tool does. It's incorporated into the training module so that inspectors and auditors and so forth know how to interpret it, right? So that everybody's kind of on the same page. So you might be able to do something like that. What the grant won't be able to do is to say, oh, we're going to look at compost risks, we're going to look at the risk of hedgerows, we're going to look at water testing, we're going to look at what you, it's not going to be all those. So a lot of it's going to be prioritizing. And then um, from those prioritizations, determining exactly what is feasible to do in terms of research methods. And it will be interdisciplinary. There'll be some field-based work, some lab-based work some social science and economics kind of work, and probably some extension work, because this is the Organic Research and Extension Initiative. So there will be some extension and outreach component as well. Um, and then from there, we'll have to go into and specify, OK, exactly who do we need in terms of expertise and institutional representation? Who's going to be on, uh, who's going to be like our advisory committee? Who's going to be stakeholder partners that are going to, because Ultimately, no matter what the research ends up being, we are going to need to be able to work with actual organic farmers and actual organic growers to do this work. Um, because we can't do the work that meets organic growers' needs without working with organic growers. Um, and we understand that that can be a, a time burden and, and a commitment burden and so forth. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's a big ask. But at the same time, we are hoping that the trade-off is that, or you know, the, the payoff is that it, um, it directly will benefit the organic growing community um, by, again, providing tools that are actually useful and meet priority needs uh, and, and, again, a cost-effective sort of way. So that, that would be the, the little bit extra that I would add onto, to, um, onto that question. Yeah, that was really great. So I have a question that's kind of a corollary or it works in relate, relation to this. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what future participation is going to look like for those people that are in attendance today? How can they get involved? What is it going to look like? Yes, yes, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the, first, the, the first response that comes to my mind is it depends. Um, uh, it partly depends on how many people we have interested. If we have 200 people that are interested, that changes what we can do versus if we have 20 people. Um, so just with that sort of caveat in mind. But um, I think the way I tend to think of it is there's a couple different sorts of levels at which people might be able to participate, depending on their time availability, their level of commitment, how much they want to do. Um, and so the really basic level is just providing some input and being present in the room and, and maybe casting a vote here and there in terms of what this proposal is going to do, what it should look like. And maybe they're not even going to be on the final proposal in an active capacity or something like that, right? But they just want to, to make sure it's going in the right direction. So I think we can definitely have people that are interested at that level. They just kind of want to be part of that conversation. But be part of the conversation, right? The future things won't be a listening session. It'll be an active participation sort of thing. Um, the kind of next level up is people that actually, I think, want to be involved in the actual grant. Um, and and that can be also at a fairly low time commitment. So generally speaking, best practice with this kind of research grant is to have an advisory committee um, that's not directly engaged in the active you know, research methods and analysis of the data and all that, but are there to um, provide active input and feedback. Um, they'll get, you know, maybe 
might meet something like quarterly to hear updates about the project, to weigh in on key decisions that need to be made in project management, to sort of review project results, interpret findings and things like that, um, and also open some doors in terms of that, um, that need for, for having industry partners to work with who are actually you know, in, in the organic growing sector. Um, so there's that level. And then there's folks, and then it sort of moves on up into much more intensive actually participating in the research, sort of being a laboratory-based scientist or being out there in the field doing some of the, the extension work and the outreach work toward the, the later stages of the project, for example. Um, being a co-PI, a co-investigator on the project or, or leading certain parts of the project. Um, and again, this project has national reach, so it's not just going to be me at the University of Rhode Island and then Amber at the Organic Center. It's going to be partners who are representative of mostly different land-grant universities and extension communities and, and so forth around the country. Um, and uh, so, to, so to make that all work. Amber, do you have uh, additional thoughts there? I mean, I think that was such a great um, tiered approach to the to the answer. <laughs> um, and I, I was just thinking that in terms of engagement, I feel like it would be really helpful to have, um, obviously, to have farmers present too. But um, certifiers or auditors or you know ag professionals, um, because one of the things that we've been talking about for the outreach component or the edu the extension component is that, and what we've seen too, I saw in the polls and what we've seen coming through is that um, it seems that there needs to be more knowledge from like knowledge of organic from the food for the food safety auditors or certifiers and and vice versa for the organic certifiers to have more knowledge about um, food safety and so I think we're going to try to really develop that part of the outreach section of the proposal which will be different than the typical kind of outreach that you plug into these proposals and so having those folks join could be really helpful to have their input. Yeah, that's really great. Um, and there's a question that was submitted that I'm going to ask next that I think um, relates a little bit to this. And, and the question is about um, considerations with like multilingual outreach and technical assistance. Um, so they make reference to being in the Central Valley. It's really diverse. Uh, can you maybe speak a little bit more to like you're thinking about that strategies surrounding all of that? Yes. Um, First thing I'd Sorry, say. Sorry for a curveball. Oh god! Sorry, I just have a thunderstorm. That thunderstorm is rolling through, and that was like the loudest. That <laughs> just scared, scared me. Pardon me. Let's move on. Stay safe, Amber. Um, <laughs> uh, I think first and foremost, we are very um, uh, attuned to the need for language um, representation. Right, and extension and outreach. That's been an issue in food safety and also any kind of regulatory or, or best practices guidance for a very, very long time. Um, there are many, um, many, many growers and farmers uh, and, and also farm managers and, and farm workers across this country that um, maybe don't speak English, don't speak English fluently, or speak English as a second language. It's not their primary, um, necessarily their primary language. And so there can be language barriers. Um, I think we're very cognizant of that. And um, so I think, again, it, it's sort of like one of these depends kind of things. So it depends on exactly what we're going to be doing. But to the extent that it makes sense, given the kind of deliverables and the kind of research activities we're engaged in and the kind of growing communities we're working with, um, I think we'll make every effort to, um, yeah, to have it be multilingual, at least bilingual English and Spanish. And if we are working in areas where there's a significant um, portion of folks who are in a different linguistic group primarily, then, then we can explore options to, to make use of, of that. But I would love, for example, if we end up with these training modules or we end up with um, any sort of, of educational materials that are coming out of this, especially that are grower facing or farmer facing, um, I, I, I really want to make sure that we have a budget uh, to at least provide basic translation for those, at least into Spanish and then possibly into other languages. Um, but yeah, so that, that's my response. Amber, do you have a 
I, yeah, I mean, I love this question and I feel like it should be brought up every single time that we're considering any kind of extension and outreach. Um, and then, you know, beyond language translation, also recognizing cultural appropriateness um, of the delivery of information. But this sort of ties into um, a mini conversation that Libby and I were having on the back end talking about the participants on today's call and how we've actually amazingly had a good representation of um, government agencies today, which is thank you. We're excited to have you here. And this is just maybe putting in another plug of something that should always be considered when we're developing, you know, educational materials to uh, make farmers' lives a little bit easier. Yeah. And yeah, because still today, so many things are available English only, or there are Spanish translations that are maybe not as good as they could be or should be, um, let alone other languages. Um, that, that may be needed. So. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to all of those government officials that are in attendance as well. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask another question that one of our attendees uh, submitted. George was wondering, when do you think the tension between organic goals and no bird poop is going to be resolved? Very technical question here, given what we've been talking about, but uh, Amber and I thought we ought to throw that one out there today. <laughs> I mean, I can start, I can tackle this, I could start if you want, Patrick, and then I'm sure you have plenty of thoughts to add to this, but I'll just sort of reiterate the point that I had made earlier in my presentation that a lot of research has been started um, and has actually even been completed. And I think that once there needs to be a policy change and a cultural change um, that work together before we start seeing overall reductions in these tensions. And so I think as more research comes out, this sort of um, alleviates the fear of perceived risk, then um, that can be followed, like that provides the scientific evidence to make policy changes, and then hopefully ult ultimately cultural changes. I don't see this happening in the very near future because all of these changes take time. Um, so I cannot give you like an estimated year or time frame, but um, I, do, I do think it's possible. So, you know, I've, <clears throat> I've noticed and I've said for a long time that part of the issue or, or part of like the underlying challenge here is that when it comes to food safety, um, enough is, is kind of never enough in terms of um, like no bird poop, for example, right? Yeah, from a, a pure food safety perspective, it'd be great if there was never any bird poop on produce, right? Is that realistic? Is that actually gonna happen in the real farming world? No. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that we wouldn't want it to happen from a biodiversity, from a conservation standpoint, and so forth. And to some extent, from a production standpoint as well, speaking to some of the positive ecosystem services associated with certain bird species and bird communities that Amber alluded to uh, at the very beginning. Um, so not only are birds going to be on the farm sort of no matter what, but there's certain ways in which we want birds to be around the farm, at least. Maybe not, you know, directly in somebody's strawberries, but, um, but around the farm. Um, so, yeah, that, that idea of a zero tolerance for birds um, that kind of comes out of this sort of zero tolerance for bird poop does need to be addressed from that standpoint as just being simply not possible. And if everybody's operating under the sort of implicit expectation that it should be possible, then that sets up an impossible situation, right? And, and from what I've seen, having worked on this area for you know, over a decade now, is again, like one of the growers mentioned in our survey, it, it falls on the grower's shoulders to deal with that impossibility. Um, and that's not a fair position to put growers in uh, for what is essentially um, a public uh, risk management choice, a policy decision of how much risk is appropriate, given that, again, scientifically, we cannot have zero. Um, and so if, if there is an assumption that we can have zero and then in the real world we don't have zero, again, then who ends up having to deal with that mismatch? It's growers, and, and that's not quite appropriate. Um, how we deal with that, again, as Amber's saying, a lot of it's a cultural shift, and a lot of it really comes down to, I think, um, working with auditors and inspectors, working with policy folks, working with folks in government and so forth to kind of, again, kind of harmonize those expectations between what's best from 
I, what's ideal, right, in a public health scenario to what's actually realistic uh, in real world farming. I lost my mute button for a second. That was really helpful. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so I'm going to ask a question about the role of government, as Amber was alluding to or mentioned a few minutes ago. We've got folks that are at every level of government in attendance here today. We see people from the federal, state, county levels. Do you maybe speak a little bit about the role of those government officials and the government in general in this work? And um, yeah, that'd be great. I'm sure they know their roles much better than I do. Um, <laughs> I'm not, not <laughs> sure I'm the expert to speak on that. Uh, we're really pleased that they're here today. I hope that this has been helpful and informative. Um, and yeah, Amber, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take that first. Ah, that's so so have... funny. I thought, Patrick, you would have some grand ideas about this. Just thinking about the role of policy, you know, and um, yeah. I don't know. I'm thinking about in, involvement in this planning grant process itself. Um, <sighs> I mean, I guess we're always, when we're talking about uh, building research that has policy implications, it is helpful to first be aware of like policies that you would want to change, like outcomes, right? Um, and so I think always having a diversity of people at the table as we're developing this research is very helpful. Um, so I would encourage to the extent that people have the, the availability and the uh, ability to contribute even to that, at that minimal level that Patrick was mentioning, where you're just sort of guiding, having some input in guiding, that's really helpful. Um, and then I think, you know, in the future, as the research is done, some of the things that come out of it, you know, again, just having open conversations, figuring out where we can, where there are points of leverage to potentially make policy changes, if that is appropriate based on the science. Yeah. And, and I mean, I do have a few thoughts, um, and and some of them are, are more specific to certain, uh, I think, public sector folks than, than others. Um, so one of the things is is the difficulty of really tracking where farmers in the growing community is in dealing with food safety. Over and over and over again, we keep hearing that costs are high, time is limited. Um, growers are left with having to deal with any sorts of frictions or challenges that do arise, and the stakes are really, really high. Um, the reason the growers are doing all of this is because they're worried about getting sued, largely speaking, if something were to happen. Um, so that's, that's a really rough situation to be in. It can be really stressful and, and anxiety-inducing and so forth. Um, or just really, really expensive to put in a system that growers can feel good about, and that, of course, favors the larger growers over the smaller growers. Um, but it, again, it's, it's been really difficult. As I mentioned early on when I was presenting the results, we had a really relatively low response rate. There's a huge proportion of growers, the vast majority of growers, that we didn't hear from. Um, and it's increasingly every year more and more difficult for academic researchers and these kind of like one-offs to, to, to reach growers and really hear what's going on and, and see the state of things. Um, a couple years back, uh, 2015 or so, like kind of right as the produce rule was coming online, um, USDA's Economic Research Service and, and the, the um, uh, NASS, God, I'm trying to remember, um, the, the, the portion of USDA that, that runs um, farmer surveys and, and you know, performs the agricultural census and so forth, did a really nice study where they included a bunch of um, food safety related questions into a big national survey. It got over 3,000 respondents. Um, and it was fantastic, and some really good information came out of, that, out of that around costs. But it was also, in a way, it hasn't been followed up. And I understand these surveys are really expensive to run. I, I get that. But it hasn't been followed up, or it has not been followed up. And, um, and there were certain questions that weren't asked, like around um, some of these challenges meeting organic standards, for example, or complying with multiple standards, or, um, uh, or things around uh, conservation and biodiversity management around water or compost and so forth, that there were some, some particular questions around that that, that weren't. So that, that was sort of, um, there was an opportunity there to, to ask more of that. So we really know which direction things are going, how much of a problem this continues to be, where, among whom. Because at this point, again, there, there's so much resolution that we're miss, missing, given how, how diverse and how heterogeneous you know, the entire US 
farming sector is, even if we're just looking at fruits and vegetables and nuts. Um, so that's one thing. Um, you know, I think the other thing is, um, again, it's a heterogeneous sector in terms of how responsive growers are to different sorts of regulation. And there continues to be a really skeptical, I would say, um, uh, subset of the overall growing population that just doesn't want to hear about this or, or is really skeptical about the reasons behind this. And there's a lot of distrust there. Um, and that's, that's a real, real issue as well. Um, and I'm sure that folks are <laughs> really well aware of that, but it, but it did come out in the survey. So I wanted to, to bring it up again. Um, but the, and the last thing is that, um, you know, what's interesting is that when the Food Safety Modernization Act was passed and, and FDA was looking at the produce rule, a lot of folks were looking at it and saying, this is going to be the gold standard. You know, if we meet this, we're going to be good. We, we can check that food safety box and we'll be set. And that's not the reality. That's not how it's played out. Um, food safety has become, in all sorts of ways, about so much more than just that. It's been about liability management. It's been about public relations. It's been about marketing. Um, it's been about supply chain management and passing risks around throughout supply chains and throughout the industry um, in a way that that sort of idea of the Food Safety Modernization Act being that gold standard, that, that if, if growers sort of passed that bar, then they were good and they didn't need to be anxious anymore. And that hasn't happened. And that was a real missed opportunity. And I'm not putting the blame for that on anybody in particular, but just pointing out that it was, it was a hope that people had had and as we see that that hope has not been has not yet been realized so any, anything that can be done to kind of move that direction um, I think would also be a big help in terms of, of managing these kind of incongruities actually having one standard instead of a whole landscape of different sort of expectations a lot of which are fairly nebulous when it when it sort of push comes to shove Great. I loved uh, all of the responses, even following up from Amber, You're not going first that time. It was fantastic, fantastic responses there. Um, okay, final question for both of you. Patrick, it's going to you first this time. Um, what is a final thought, final key takeaways in the next like two minutes for those that are in attendance before we wrap up and send them on their way for the day? Cost. When it comes down to cost and time. Um, there are so, so, so many things that we as a society want agriculture and our farms to do, and some things we want them not to do. Um, and uh, a lot of those have, are, are because we want healthy food, we want clean environments, we want safe food, we want jobs and employment and, and so on and so on. Um, and, uh, but a lot of the costs get put on growers, right? Um, and, and I think we, that's the same thing we see here and, and why there's so much emphasis on the cost. Growers are expected to do more and it's kind of like, well, where's, where's the money coming from? Where's the time coming from? Um, and I, I really do think that drives a lot of some of that skepticism that we, that, that we saw and that we have seen and that we continue to see, which is our society, our public, our, and so forth, and has a lot of expectations. Um, but those do cost money and they take time. And that has to be, that has to be recognized better than it is now, especially the additive um, when we just keep layering different sorts of expectations on. Not saying that those expectations are unreasonable. I tend to think most of them are, but that has to be met on the other side by the appropriate resources and support. Thanks, Patrick. I'll uh, follow up to say that I think that there is an enormous opportunity for the benefit of collaboration. Um, we talk all the time about how interdisciplinary science is so much stronger, even though it's very challenging to implement. And we're seeing, this is a perfect example, and we're seeing it from the farmers themselves say that we need to have more communication between different regulatory agencies. And so, um, yeah, it's just clear that we could accomplish so much more um, if we had more people talking to each other. Yeah. Well, um, I think those are some really important key takeaways for the conversation. And I want to say thanks to both of you. Before I even say more thanks, I'm going to quickly flag for those of you in attendance. 
we had a really great webinar a few weeks ago as well on integrating livestock and organic crops. Um, if you missed that, you'll see a chat come through from Naomi in just a second. And also including with this webinar, as soon as I get this, uh, the recording downloaded and shared on YouTube, we'll be sending out communications to you all to watch this again, to share it with your networks, whether you're working in government, whether you're a fellow farmer, or you are in industry, get the word out um, to, to connect with Patrick and Amber on next steps. Um, the, all of our on-demand webinars are available on our website, and this one will be there within the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, again, as I was just saying, thank you so much to Patrick and to Amber for a really great, I think, conversation. I cannot wait to see where things go in this work, in this planning grant, the next steps. Um, we are so thankful for everyone in attendance for joining us today for an hour and a half. And we're so thankful for the work that the two of you put in to preparing and the work in the future to come. And with that, uh, on behalf of the Organic Trade Association, our board, our members, thanks everyone. Have a wonderful day.